Well, hello. My name's Adrian Gilbert and I'd like to welcome you once more to the Invisible College. Now, today's lecture is the first in a series, a new series that I'm putting together, which I'm calling Angels and Aliens. Now, that's a sort of fairly rough, um, gives us an area to work within, but each lecture is going to be on different subjects and I want to cover, cover the whole gamut of understanding and investigation and theories concerning everything that we think of as being uh, angels and what we associate with being aliens and how there could be any sort of linkage um, between the two concepts. But this first lecture that I'm going to do today really um, starts with us and it starts with us for a very good reason that within our culture actually most cultures on the earth, we have this concept that humankind has somehow fallen, that we ourselves are a type of fallen angel in a way, that we have come down from something higher and are now trapped within the earth's sphere. And of course the most familiar um, uh, ideas we have about this, the most familiar story, uh, in the West is the, is the story we read in the Bible concerning Adam and Eve. So th I'm going to begin this lecture and we're going to look at the Bible and the Bible story to see what clues this might have for us in our investigations. That doesn't mean that this is um, going to be a, a religious um, lecture, investigation, far from it. Uh, I'm very interested in all theories and all philosophies uh, connected with trying to find out what our situation is here. But it's a good place to start, is where we are now, and that is the, uh, the within Western culture anyway, the concepts and the ideas that we find within our Bible, the central uh, teachings of the Christian religion. Now when I raise the, the word angel, I'm sure that what comes to light with most people is going to be um, something like this. We have the familiar figure of an angel as being a, a, somehow a robed, um, smiling, happy, um, good-natured, beautiful uh, individual. But the thing that makes them different, though, from us is they got wings. <laughs> but I think we all understand that that's not to be taken literally. We don't expect to sort of be walking down the street and suddenly there's a guy with wings comes up next to us. Rather, it's a reflection of the idea that angels are numinous creatures. That is to say, they're invisible to us and can move from place to place through the air, through the atmosphere, through space. Um, and that is kind of brought home to us, the idea that like birds, they're not tied to earth, they can fly, they can move from place to place. And of course we have the idea that these angels, the word angel, uh, I believe, means messenger. So we have also the concept that these angels, in their biblical um, terminology anyway, are mainly messengers of God, sent down to earth to convey... Um, his, his wishes to certain individuals. And of course, the most famous angel of this sort is the angel Gabriel. And we meet him several times in the Bible. Most notably, he comes to the Virgin Mary, or so we're told, and tells her of God's plan for a Messiah and asks her if she's willing to bear Jesus. And she, she says yes, and she becomes pregnant. We don't know how. So... We have this idea that there are these angels who are messengers who are sent from above to down here below to convey the wishes of the divine or sometimes to convey judgments. For instance, angels come down to the city of Sodom and destroy it. They, they, they part, judgment is passed on these people and, and they're destroyed. Same thing happens in Egypt. We read of how the firstborn are to be slain and, and certain angels come along and they, they kill the firstborn of the Egyptians. So there is a sense that there are these higher entities 
Are they aliens? Are they uh, spirits? What are they who are able to come here to earth and to enact the will of God? But those aren't the only angels we meet with. We also have what you might call familiar angels. Um, most notably are what, what are called our guardian angels that each person has assigned to him, allotted an angel who will walk with him through life and at times of crisis will give guidance, maybe some kind of spiritual help uh, to help the person to get through some of life's difficulties. And that's a very um, heartwarming idea um, that we have these people, perhaps, uh, angels, lower angels, who are willing to give of themselves to help us. But of course, conversely, we also have the idea that sitting at our left side is a devil. <laughs> and this devil is our personal devil who's tempting us all the time to do evil, to do wrong. So we have this conflict between the good voice on one side, arguing that we should do one thing, and the bad voice on the other side, arguing that we should do something else. And we'll come back to this idea of where this idea comes from later on in this series. But let's go back to the beginning and to the biblical teachings concerning the birth of mankind and how man came into the world. So let's start at the beginning with um, the book of Genesis, which talks about how God created man out of the dust of the earth. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, you can read a Bible yourself if you're interested. I'm sure most people have already heard this story many times before. And this is not a Bible class. However, I'm just going to read quickly through the story of the creation of Adam because it has some relevance for what comes later. So it goes here. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we have this story here that, that God's created all these things, and he created man and woman and told them that they have dominion over the earth. So far, well and good. But there's a second creation story in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, which talks about how God formed man, or Adam, out of the, the, uh, the clay and breathed life into him, and then took a rib from him and made woman out of Adam's rib. You've heard of Adam's rib um, uh, as a kind of euphemism for, for womankind. Well, that's obviously quite sort of a mythological idea itself. But there's a suggestion that there were two creations here. First, a spiritual creation, and the second, a physical one. And the physical man is put into the garden, the Garden of Eden. And we're not told exactly where that is, except that it's surrounded by four rivers uh, that flow out from it. And that gives us a fairly good idea that it must have been somewhere in eastern Turkey, Mount Ararat region. That's not to say there really was a garden there, but this is where the story must have come from, the, the figurative story, at least in the form that we have it today within our Bibles. So all well and good, but 
he's told them they can go and eat all these fruits on the trees and, you know, they can go picking this, that and the other. But then he says that there's one tree you mustn't eat from and it's forbidden to you. Uh, it's a tree that's growing in the middle of the garden, which is a very strange idea in itself. Why, if there's going to be a particular tree that they mustn't eat from, and they're told that if they do, they'll die, um, is it not fenced off? I mean, here are these two naive new people being just being created. They don't know anything. They're idiots. Stupid. Um, and yet they've been put in this garden with this very, very dangerous tree in the middle of it. And then, to make it worse, it's got a serpent in it. <laughs> and we're told that the serpent is the, the smartest of all the creatures. So there they are, in this garden with a poisonous tree and a serpent. And the serpent comes and he tells Eve, he says, oh, well, you don't want to listen too much to what that God character has to say. <laughs> He doesn't want you to eat the fruit because if you do, you'll be as smart as he is. And he doesn't want that, does he? So, you know, eat the fruit and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be wise like the gods. So Adam and Eve, they think about this and she, she takes the fruit and eats it. Tastes all right. Doesn't taste poisonous. Gives it to Adam. He eats it. Yeah. Oh, and then suddenly they wake up and they suddenly realize, oh, my God, here I am and I'm naked. And I'm naked in the garden and this God is going to come back any minute, he's going to find out we've been scrumping his fruit off the tree, what are we going to do? Well, of course, God does come back, and he then tells them off big time and throws them out of the garden. And Adam is ordered out, and an angel escorts them out of the garden. This is where we meet our first angel. And it's an angel who has a flaming sword, so he guards the entrance they can't get back into the garden because of the angel with the flaming sword. And we'll come back to who he might be in a later lecture. So anyway, now they're in a situation where they're told that they're going to have to make their own living on the earth. Adam now has to till the soil if he wants to raise a crop. And he starts keeping a few sheep and goats. And Eve, meanwhile, is told that from now on, childbirth is going to be much more painful for her and for her descendant women. So what's that all about? Is, why this punishment with this extra pain? Well, let's just take a step back for a minute. Um, we know very well from our science and from our investigations of geology, our investigations of anthropology, and zoology, that life did not appear here in one you know, period of six days with uh, a man suddenly planted here, and that's how it just all came about. We know that there's been life on this planet for millions of years, and that there were dinosaurs a long time ago, extinct now. We know that there were mammals, the first mammals were kind of small mouse-like, creatures and then they grew up and we had woolly mammoths and we had big bison and goodness knows what. And we also had the first men and they weren't at all like us. You know, there were um, Neanderthals and, and Peking man and, you know, all these different Java man, Graciles, Darcians, all these people, you know, we've, we've got their skulls, we've got bits and pieces of them. We know that they existed before us, and we're called Homo sapiens sapiens. So what is it that is happening here? Well, one of the things that is quite clear about man as we know them today is that we have relatively large brains. And the reason, the reason we have that is, is if you want to have intelligence, high intelligence, you need a big brain. But if you're going to have a big brain, you're going to have a big head. And as any woman will tell you, it's giving birth is the, 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 the problem is getting the head out. Get the head out and the rest comes out relatively easily. So if you've got a big head, a baby with a big head, then it's going to be much more painful. So it seems that this fall of man is somehow connected with our becoming more intelligent, knowing good and evil is how it's put in the Bible, so the serpent warns, you know, you know, or he, he advises 
eat that fruit and yeah, you're going to be more intelligent. You're going to be smarter. You'll be like him. And we know that that means a bigger brain. So these things are connected. There it does seem to have been some kind of um, upgrading, that's the way I like to put it, of our, our potential that happened, which is somehow connected with this Adam and Eve story. That's a myth, mythology, a uh, symbolic way of telling the story. But there does seem to be something behind this story that does seem to co coincide with what we read in the fossil record as well, that there was a step up with mankind, um, which involved getting larger heads. And then the, the, what we call now the Neolithic Revolution, when we started growing crops and keeping our animals as livestock instead of hunting. Yes, there was still hunting and gathering going on, obviously, but we also realised that instead of running around in the jungle trying to catch yourself something to eat, it's better if you raise your livestock in a pen and then you can take them as you want, which is what, of course, we do now. And if instead of looking around to um, get a few, glean a few barley heads or um, pick a few apples when they're in season, better still grow your crops, harvest them, put them into storage, and then you can eat and you have more time. So these things are connected. The idea of our larger heads and also the Neolithic Revolution do seem to be connected. And what's also interesting, I think, is that the uh, cultural revolution we witness in the Near East and in you know, Egypt all takes place around about 4000 BC, which is when, in the Bible, Adam is supposed to have appeared on Earth. Um, suddenly, around that time, people start building uh, houses, they start building temples, they start uh, building the first step pyramids and we get this explosion of development learning about how to read and write uh, as i was saying building uh, keeping livestock all these things seem to happen around this kind of period so there does seem to be some something to this story more than just um, a fairy tale myth told for children in the bible but what about that old serpent well, we're told that there was, a, there was also some kind of a falling of the angels that occurred. It wasn't just mankind that fell, but the angels too. And the prime uh, angel to experience this, of course, was a guy called Luf Lucifer. And he, was, we're told, was the brightest of the angels. Lucifer means bearer of light. And it has been surmised that this is a reference to the planet Venus, which uh, is also known by that title because it, it, uh, when it rises as a morning star at dawn, uh, it's the brightest of the planets and it heralds the coming of the sun. So it is the bringer of light, the bringer of the sun. Anyway, Lucifer himself also seems to have got too big for his boots. He decides that he wants to do his own thing. He's fed up with taking orders from him up there. So he wants to do his own, own stuff. And he uh, summons or uh, rouses a bunch of other angels and says to them, look, we don't have to take orders from this big guy up there. How about we do our own thing? Yeah, let's go and, go and, and start our own company, our own business. Yeah, we're going to competition. You know, he's no, not really any smarter than we are. So he causes a rebellion among the angels, a revolution, you might say. And as, as is to be expected, they don't get away with it, just like Adam and Eve. Yeah, they do, you know, they're eating the fruit and they're chucked out of the garden. So the angels were told... Fallen angels are thrown out of heaven. There's a big battle in heaven. Michael the Archangel leads the good guys, uh, you know, going to do the will of God, and they throw out these dissidents, these uh, anarchists that wish to <laughs> subvert God's kingdom. So they, they're thrown out and they go down to earth. 
And we have the familiar picture of St. Michael, who again is this angel of casting out. He actually is the one that's connected with the flaming sword. But we'll understand that better in a later lecture. He is often shown in church um, iconography, in, in the act of throwing out the devil. And the devil is also shown as this kind of dragon figure very frequently. And St. Michael is either spearing him or chopping him with a sword or, or however, dealing with this dragon, casting, casting him out. And he goes from being Lucifer to becoming Satan. And we see him very frequently depicted. He's now got sort of bat wings instead of angel wings. That implies that he's a beast of the night. Bats fly at night time. And he's um, ugly, he's devious, and he's, he's looking to subvert the earth now, having failed in his attempt to subvert heaven. So he's now become Satan, but there's another understanding to that name, Satan. And we meet with him next within the book of Job. The book of Job, if you've ever read it, there's an appalling story. <laughs> There's a good man called Job, and he does all the right things. He's, uh, he's, he's wealthy, he's, uh, he's a farmer, he's got lovely children, lovely house, he treats his servants well, he worships God and does everything that's required of him, and he loves God. And Satan comes along to God and says, well, it's all very well, him saying that he loves you and everything, you know, it's, it's good. But, you know, he's got, it, he's got it all right, hasn't he? Of course he will, yeah. You've looked after him. He's going to do that. What happens if he's in trouble? Is he still going to love you then? So God says, I think he will. So Satan was, well, let's see about that. So God says, okay, you go out and tempt him. You go out and do what you want. I'm sure he'll be all right. So bit by bit, Satan strips away everything from Job. His children are killed. He loses his money, he gets covered in boils, uh, he's put into a terrible state. And all the time he still says, yes, I love God, I'm, you know, I don't know what's happened, why I, this is happening to me, but I, you know, I still worship and love him. And eventually, of course, God says, okay, you see, he was a good guy, and everything is returned to him. Well, who is this Satan that's doing this? Well, it ties in somehow with astrology that the name Satan is actually Saturn. And Saturn in astrology is the planet that is supposedly testing us. And it brings hardship into our lives. It brings problems to us. You often wonder, why me? You know, what's happened to me? Why is this happening to me? Well, if you're into astrology, you would probably be looking at the positioning of Saturn <laughs> for why such a thing might happen. It doesn't happen all the time. You go through periods when Saturn is perhaps stronger in its actions on you, and other times when you're more under the influence of Jupiter, which is great because Jupiter brings you wealth, brings you honors, position, all these kind of things. This is if you believe in astrology. So we have this other side to the Lucifer Satan story that is somehow connected with the the need that man be tempted and and uh, worked upon because the idea is that if it doesn't kill you then it's going to make you stronger you probably heard that saying if it doesn't kill me it make me stronger well this is the idea with the problems that come into our lives that our lives are not always well, not for most people, um, a path of roses, that there are going to be troubles, there's going to be problems, and how you deal with those, how you face them, how you overcome them, very much determines um, your destiny, but it also it leads to your own growth. So in this sense, Satan, Saturn, is to be welcomed. It might sound strange to say that, but if you don't have any opposition... You become weak. And there's a saying, if you want to build up your, your muscles, that you press one, one hand against the other very, very hard. And if you do that, you'll build up your shoulder muscles. <laughs> That's 
that was the secret of Charles Atlas. So we have that understanding of sa Satan, Saturn, but there's also this dragon thing to consider. And I want you now to think a moment about what that might be symbolizing within the biblical story. Because we're told that initially there was a dragon or, or a serpent up in the tree. Who the, the tree which was the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree with the fruit that Adam and Eve ate and then fell. And there actually is a constellation called Draco the Dragon, which is in the northern sky. And it's an important constellation. Uh, because if you think about it, the earth, think of the earth. As we all know, the earth turns on its axis. And it has a north and a south pole, which um, are the axes of the earth. But you can extend those poles. And the north pole extended points to the North Star, the, the due north. South Pole points to near the Southern Cross. But I want to concentrate on the North at the moment. So North Pole points towards the North Star, which for us is Polaris. But it wasn't always that way. At the time of ancient Egypt, when they were building the pyramids, the North Star was a star called Thuban, um, Alpha Draconis, which is actually in the constellation of Draco the dragon. So, at the, around about 4000 BC, which is this Adam and Eve time that we've been talking about, uh, the North Star was actually within the dragon, within, within Draco. And that would have been where the axis of the Earth pointed. If we think about the axis of the Earth, it is actually like a tree, or a maypole, or a pole that points upwards. So at the top of this, sitting on the top, is actually a serpent, the Draco the dragon. And I'll come back to that idea shortly. But of course the Earth isn't sort of standing upright in its orbit, it is actually tipped over 23 and a half degrees as it goes around the Sun. So there is a second axis which we can call the pole of the ecliptic. It's the pole, if you think of the orbit of the Earth itself, it has its own pole, which is more or less going through the Sun. It's not quite because the, um, the orbit of the Earth is not exactly circular, but more or less. And we call that the pole of the ecliptic. And the north pole of the Earth is angled to that pole by 23 and a half degrees. And what's interesting is that the Earth, as it, we know that it goes round on its, ax, on its axis once a day, and it goes round the sun once a year. But there is actually another cycle as well, and that is that it has a slight wobbly motion, like a spinning top that's running down which takes uh, one rotation, takes roughly 25,800 years to complete. And we call this motion the precession of the equinoxes, or the precessional motion. And the reason for that is it, has, it causes the first day of spring to slide back through the zodiac. This is another lesson, I won't go into this here, but it causes the first day of spring to slide back through the zodiac at a rate of roughly one day every 72 years. So life of one man will see movement of one degree of the processional cycle of, of the equinox. And as you probably heard, the, currently the first day of spring is in the sign of Pisces, and it will be going into the sign of Aquarius, hence the idea of this dawning of the age of Aquarius. But that's a whole other subject, and I don't want to go into that here. But it has another aspect to this as well, and that is that the, the point in the sky that the North Pole is pointing towards also changes and moves round in a circle, which takes the same period of time, 25,800 years, 
to complete a, a complete cycle. So at the time of the, the pyramids, it was pointing at Thuban in Draco. Today, it's pointing at the star called Polaris, which is in the tail of the little bear, the last star on the tail of the little bear. In around 12,000 years, I believe, um, it's going to be pointing um, towards Vega in the, the constellation of the Lyre. And it'll carry on moving around. Eventually, it'll come back to um, Thuban and Draco again, and back to Polaris, and it keeps going round and round and round. So, there is this sense that the dragon has fallen in that the North Star is no longer pointing at the dragon. It's now pointing towards the tail of the little bear. So there is also this thing, the idea that when God uh, comes along to his garden and he sees, oh dear, they've eaten the fruit. I told them not to and they've eaten the fruit. Uh, he, he said, right, well, you know, I'm sorry God, it wasn't really our fault. It was this serpent. It's his fault. He told us to eat it. And God curses the serpent and says, right, from now on you're going to crawl on your belly um, on, in the dust and man's heel will bruise your head and your head will bruise his heel. There'll be enmity between your seed and their seed. Well, this is a sense of the serpent falling out of the tree and I think it somehow is connected with this movement of the processional cycle. But we'll be coming back to that some time later. But meanwhile, the pole of the ecliptic is still in the constellation of Draco. It's not exactly on his body, but it's, it doesn't change. Unless the Earth changes its orbit, the actual orbit around the Sun, that stays constant. And that is still pointing towards um, just below the head of Draco, the dragon. So there is also the, this idea of somehow the serpent is controlling the, the movement of the Earth. It's controlling uh, our, our planet's axis, pointing towards it. But unless that axis shifted, then it, it carries on, unless the axis of the ecliptic shifted, I should say, it will carry on having influence here. Right, now I want us to leave the Bible and turn to another set of writings known as the Hermetica. <clears throat> now these were produced in ancient Egypt uh, in the, probably towards the, the very end of the first century BC, in the first couple of centuries AD. But they're very important because they represent the last outpouring of the ancient Egyptian religion, uh, the religion which had built the pyramids and uh, uh, Tutankhamun's tomb and, and all of the temples and so forth in Egypt. Uh, this is the kind of the last outpouring of that sort of pagan wisdom prior to the coming of Christianity, which became, of course, the state religion of the Roman Empire around 325 AD. And they have a lot to say about the same subject. The, 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 the word Hermetica itself comes from Hermes, the god called Hermes Trismegistus, that's what the Greeks used to call him, uh, but the, Greek, the, the ancient Egyptians themselves would have known him as Thoth or Tehuti. And he's also equated with the Hebrew patriarch Enoch. Uh, Enoch's mentioned briefly in the Bible as having walked and then been uh, on the earth and been taken by God. And then there's a whole book of Enoch, we'll be talking about that a bit later. But the, the Hermetica themselves represent dialogues uh, between the teacher and his student. Uh, very often that's, that the teacher is, is actually Thoth or Tehuti or um, Hermes talking to one or another of his students, very often someone called Asclepius. And they're written in the form of Platonic dialogues. This is kind of like Greek um, Egyptian teachings in Greek clothing is the way to put it. And they're very important because they, they show us a different view of some of these same events that we see described in the Bible. 
And the first one I want to turn to um, is from a book called the Coro, Coro Cosmo, which means the Virgin of the World. And that's one of the writings contained in the Hermetica. And it has this to say about the creation of souls and how they became proud and arrogant and where Hermes himself was uh, instructed to create bodies for them and put them on the earth. The procedure is described thus. And I, said Hermes, sought to find out what material I was to use, and I called on the sole ruler, and he commanded the souls to hand over to me the residue of the mixture. Remember, they've been told to do some creating themselves. They've been given some stuff, some God's stuff, to make plants and things out of. But when I received it, I found it was quite dried up. You can imagine like a potter wanting to work with clay. You find, oh, this clay is a bit too, too dry. I therefore used much water for mixing with it. And when I had thereby renewed the liquid constituent, consistency of the stuff, I fashioned bodies out of it. And the work of my hands was fair to view. And I was glad when I looked on it. And I called on the sole ruler to inspect, and he saw it and was glad. And he gave order that the soul should be embodied. So here, yeah, instead of it being God who's making the Adam out of the clay of the earth, he's delegated that task to Hermes, who in Egyptian terms is the god Thoth. And he's made the bodies which the men are now, or the souls, those who have been haughty, are now going to have to go and live in. And this is what we hear about what the souls have to say when they discover what their fate is to be. When they were about to be shut up in the bodies, some of them wailed and moaned, just that and nothing more, but some there were that struggled against their doom, even as beasts of noble temper, when they're caught by the crafty tricks of cruel men and dragged away from the wild land that is their home, strive to fight against those who have mastered them. And another shrieked, and again and again, turning his eyes now upward and now downward, said, O thou heaven, source of our being, and ye bright shining stars, and never failing light of sun and moon, and ye ether and air, and holy life breath of him who alone rules alone, ye that have shared our home, how cruel it is that we are being torn away from this so great, from things so great and splendid. We are to be expelled from the holy atmosphere and placed nigh to the vault of heaven and from the blissful life we lived there and to be imprisoned in habitations mean and base as these. Poor wretches that we are, what hard necessities await us, what hateful things we shall have to do in order to supply the needs of this body that must so soon perish. So we have this idea that um, these souls have been ordered to go into these bodies which Hermes has, has made on the instructions from the Most High, from God, as a punishment for their, their arrogance, their haughtiness, their self-belief. You know, because they had been given the instructions to do a bit of creating, but they got carried away and thought they were equal to God. Again, coming back to the same thing that we had in the Bible, when the serpent was whispering into the ear of Adam and saying, oh, you know, don't worry about eating the fruit, it'll make you as clever as he is. So it's a slightly different picture in the sense that um, these Adam and Eve uh, people that we meet with in the Bible weren't quite the sort of naive savages that um, we might expect, that they had actually been souls before that somewhat analogous to the angels. And we get another version of this again in another writing in the Hermetica. It's actually the first, the first chapter of it, which is called the Poimandries. And it has this to say about this whole, whole idea and gives again a different, different slant on it of, the, of what the fall was all about. But mind, the father of all, he who is life and light 
gave birth to man, a being like to himself, and he took delight in man as being his own offspring. For man was very goodly to look on, bearing the likeness of the Father. With good reason, then, did God take delight in man, for it was God's own form that God took delight in. And God delivered over to man all things that had been made. So, again, rather the same as what the Bible is saying. Man is made in God's image. God loves him because he's looking at his own image. And man took station in the, God's, in the maker's sphere. Now, we'll be coming to that in a second, this idea that there are different spheres um, around us. There's uh, the earth and there's planetary spheres and there's angelic spheres beyond that. And ultimately, there's, there's God's sphere, the maker's sphere. So man took station in the maker's sphere and observed the things made by his brother who was set over the region of fire. Uh, this brother is um, actually the sun or the solar, solar logos who's been instructed to make the solar system. It's called a brother because, uh, like man, he has a soul uh, created directly by the maker. Who was set over the region of fire, and having observed the maker's creation in the region of fire, he willed to make things for his own part also, and his father gave permission. So yeah, again, we have this idea that man is a soul, and... He's looked on the creation and he's asked God and he said, look, I'd like to do a bit of creating myself. And God said, yeah, okay. Uh, and his father gave permission, having in himself all the workings of the administrators. And the administrators took delight in him and each of them gave him a share of his own nature. Now these administrators are within the context of the Hermetica. It's the names of the planets or more accurately, the planetary spheres or the the spirits of the planets. Each planet has a certain spirit associated with it. You may remember that in medieval times they thought about the planets being pushed around their, their circuits by angels. Well, that's not quite how they visualise things. In, in Egyptian times, they, they saw that each sphere had its own spirit, its maker, and that the planet which occupied that sphere, uh, was made, made by that maker. And each of them gave him a share of his own nature. So man is given a bit of Jupiter stuff, a bit of Saturn stuff, a bit of Mars stuff, a bit of Mercury stuff. And having learnt to know the being of the administrators and received a share of their natures, he willed to break through the bounding orbits of their uh, bounding circles of their orbits, and he looked down through the structure of the heavens, having broken through the sphere, and showed the downward tending nature, the beautiful form of God. So, the the, the classic ancient way of viewing um, the heavens was that there were these spheres around the sphere of the earth, each one occupied by a planet with its own administrator, and beyond them there was the sphere of the fixed stars, known as the celestial sphere, or the heavenly sphere, and beyond that are the angelic regions and God himself. So man breaks through this sphere of, uh, of the stars and looks down through the planetary spheres at nature, and he shows her his beautiful form. And she looks up and says, oh my goodness, there's this, this creature in the form of God. And nature, seeing the beauty of the form of God, smiled with insatiate love of man, showing the reflection of that most beautiful form in the water and its shadow on the earth. And he, seeing this form, a form like to his own in earth and water, loved it and willed to dwell there, and he took up his abode in matter devoid of reason. And nature, when she got him with whom she was in love, wrapped him in her clasp, and they were mingled in one, for they were in love with one another. Now, this is again a profound uh, teaching and understanding which actually illuminates the Bible teachings quite a lot. 
because the, the word Eve in the Bible actually means mother of all things. She is actually mother nature, not really a woman, as, as you know, we tend to think of. She is, she is woman as the personification of nature. Adam is the personification of the human race. And in the Hermetic version of this, nature sees man, the souls of man, and wants him to come and join her. And he sees it a reflection in nature of his own divine nature, his own godliness, and is attracted, just as a man is attracted to a woman and a woman is attracted to a man. So they, man is drawn towards nature and she's drawn to him and clasps him and he loses his reason. He loses his, his understanding of what he really is and becomes in a, in a, trapped within the bonds of nature. And this is actually exactly the same teaching that they have in India um, within the Vedantic um, systems where they teach that there is this spirit of nature they call Maya and mankind or an individual men and women are trapped within the illusion this world of illusion of nature holds us back keeps us trapped and we do not perceive our own identity we don't see that we are really kind of angels living in flesh we be tend to think of ourselves as just being like the beasts in the field, slightly cleverer animals, which of course is the, the modern view of mankind, particularly um, championed by people like Richard Dawkins, that there's nothing else. This is all there is, lads. Enjoy it while it lasts. Um, eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you're going to die, and that's it. Psst. No more. You know, you're finished. And the only thing that will survive you is your offspring, and whatever um, books you may have written or things you've made during your life. Which is a very pessimistic view, and it's not the view that was held in ancient times. It's certainly not the view I hold, um, and it's not the view of the Hermetica. The teachings that we're getting there are that man was this divine being originally, uh, in the sphere of the Maker, and he descended down through the spheres, now, this was actually re-examined and explored a great deal in the 17th century. And particularly, I want to give reference to this gentleman here, um, Dr. Robert Flood, who lived between 1574 to 1637 and wrote a number of remarkable books around about the 1620s. And he actually lived not very far from where I, I live. He lived in Kent and uh, not far from Maidstone. And uh, he produced a lot of, wrote a number of books and some wonderful diagrams, and I'd like to draw your attention to this one first, which shows this whole idea, these little soul figures, like little cherubs or angels, coming from the mind of God at the top and descending these different spheres. And you can see the first block of spheres it goes through our various angelic spheres, and it comes down, and the, the souls wind their way down like a corkscrew. They go down through all those spheres and then through the planetary spheres, and they end up on Earth, incarnated as mankind. So this is a hermetic teaching. He's based this on the hermetica. Um, but I want to sort of draw your attention to something else, that within his diagram there are definite regions in the middle, we've got the Earth, shown as a, this yellow circle. And then we've got the planetary spheres, and I've lumped them all together as this sort of pink round there. And that stretches from the sphere of the Moon out to the sphere of Saturn, um, and the, the, beyond that, the, the sphere of the fixed stars. I suppose today, if we were drawing this, we would put in the sphere of Uranus and Neptune. It kind of upsets the order, because it's only meant to be seven, and then we've got nine. Pluto, I believe, is no longer considered a planet. <laughs> I've always thought that. It probably is an escaped moon of, of Neptune or Uranus that finally, you know, pushed out of its, its orbit and ended up 
doing an extraordinary orbit around the sun uh, as a sort of renegade moon. Anyway, that's by the by. And beyond the planetary spheres, we've got the angelic spheres. And then we have the mind. Of and we can turn now to another diagram by Robert Flood. Um, this one actually shows the link between man and nature. Again, we can see the angelic spheres surrounding uh, outside of the uh, outermost uh, ring of stars. And then we've got the planetary rings beneath that. And underneath those, we've got the sort of natural world depicted. We have this female figure standing. She's, one, one arm is attached um, by a chain to God, Inri, at the top there in a little cloud. And the other chain is attached going down to this sort of monkey figure in the middle. You can see it more clearly here. Now she, she represents nature, uh, sometimes called the anima mundi, the soul of the world. And she's also, you, you'll see her in the tarot pack, which we'll be discussing in another lecture, where it's actually, she's actually the last card of the, the pack, sometimes called the world or sometimes anima mundi. And she represents nature, but nature, the, the, the way that nature can put on many millions of different costumes, every creature that exists, every plant, every animal, every insect, every worm, is all part of, of nature. Nature is highly adaptable, can wear all these different masks and clothings. And that's why she's like um, the, the Hindu Maya, uh, representing the, the world of illusion, the world of enticement. And that's why she's very frequently shown as a female figure, because what is more enticing, at least to men, than the naked female figure. So we see her here depicted as holding by a chain this ape who represents man. Man not as he was originally created in the heavenly or beyond the heavenly regions in the mind of God, but man as he is down here on earth, uh, where he's become just a kind of clever ape. And we see him here with his pair of dividers and a, a globe in his hand. He's trying to work out sciences. He's trying to work out what is this place I'm living in? Where, what's this all about? How, how do I understand all this? And of course, he's not using, he's not understanding that actually the biggest mystery is who he is. <laughs> It's not a question of him trying to understand the world around him, the, na the world of nature. The world of nature is there, but he won't understand uh, himself until he realizes himself. This is the great message of, of this diagram, uh, which Robert Flood gives us. And here we see uh, another diagram uh, taken from the alchemist, where again we see man He's in this hypnotic trance. He's actually as though he's in a grave and he's wound up, embraced by the dragon. The dragon is holding him. This dragon is actually again nature who holds him in her embrace. All his, his arts and his crafts, his civilizations that he built, his pyramids, his Colosseum, his churches, everything, it comes and it goes you know, it, it rises and it falls because it's all tied in with cycles of nature. And, but he himself is held in this hypnotic trance, um, very like, actually, if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, where the, um, the, the people like Neo and the other humans are actually being held captives in what is effectively battery cells. They're being used... The electricity that their bodies generate is being used to power up machines, while they actually themselves, or their minds, are engaged in a dream world, which is what the Matrix really is within the context of that movie. So we're seeing ourselves here as um, man entranced, and what we have to do if we wish to progress is somehow to wake up from our entrancement. Now, another great writer around that same period uh, as Robert Flood was Athanasius Kircher, lived from 1602 to 1680. 
And he was a Jesuit priest, so he's, in, in a sense, in the opposite camp to Flood. Flood is a Protestant um, uh, visionary um, philosopher, Rosicrucian. Kirscher is a Jesuit priest, and he's part of the Counter-Reformation, uh, producing new ideas to filter into the Roman Catholic religion in answer to what is going on with the, the Reformed churches within the Protestant faith. And he's a great, very great thinker himself. And some of his diagrams do bear similarity. He clearly knew a great deal about the sort of whole hermetic uh, um, uh, renaissance, the whole hermetic ideas. And we see one of his pictures here uh, of his philosophical universe. And here we're seeing um, creations, again, split into three. At the top of our picture, we've got the angelic realms, nine um, uh, nine-pointed triangle or three triangles linked together to make a nine-pointed star, and within that, there's a, a triangle which represents the Holy Trinity, God Himself. So there's nine of nine. There's nine little angelic figures. They represent the nine orders of angels, and beneath that, we see this winged sphere containing within it the spheres of the planets. This represents the heavenly worlds, the worlds up there, the world of uh, the stars and the planets and astrology and all of that level of creation. And then below that, we're seeing the earthly realm. And we've got two philosophers here. Um, the one on the right is clearly Pythagoras. He's got his uh, Pythagorean triangle um, the three, four, five triangle, a square on a hypotenuse equals the square on the other two sides. And then we've got a figure who's, um, he, he, <coughs> he might be Solomon, um, the famous wise man of, of Israel, with his, because he's got a book open with uh, the, the, the seal of Solomon and the seal of David. On the other hand, he might be Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. Either way, he is a philosopher. So we've got the philosophers there, and they're looking uh, across at the, the world and up at the stars, but they're not seeing everything. And here we can see in detail uh, his, his Aeneid, um, the nine orders of angels arranged around um, the, the figure, the, the, the tetragrammaton or the, the triangle of Yahudvahi or however we want to pronounce it, and the eye of God in the middle. And you can see more clearly here the, um, the planetary spheres within the, the outermost um, celestial sphere, the, the sphere of the fixed stars. So the same ideas coming through that we had with Kirscher, um, with his, his diagram about nature, is that we're living in a situation where we're not seeing what's actually really happening. Yes, we are in the sense of the world, and to some extent, the sense of moving bodies in the sky, but we're not appreciating the heavenly regions from the right perspective. And here we can see the nine orders of angels uh, as, uh, as given by flood. Um, below the mens. Mens means mind. And that, the first sphere there, the mind of God, we're told in the Hermetica, is what creates man in the first place. And then we have below that um, the seraphim, the cherubim, the dominations, the thrones, the potencies, the principalities, the virtues, and then we have the archangels and angels. So the archangels actually only represent the second sphere up from us of angels. They're only just above angels. Beyond them, we've got higher orders of, of beings, if, if being is the right word to use in that context, reaching back towards God. And the seven archangels are, generally speaking, named. We've met with Gabriel and Michael, but two other famous uh, uh, angels that are talked about in the Bible and in other holy books, particularly are Raphael and Uriel. They figure a lot, particularly Raphael, who's the angel associated with healing. 
And then we've got three others, Simiel, who's also called Remiel in some places, Raguel, Orifiel, and Jophiel. They make up the seven archangels. And this brings us to the, uh, back to the book of Genesis, where we're told that Jacob, the prophet Jacob, the grandson of, of uh, Abraham, had a dream. And he was at a place called um, Luz, and he laid a stone down, and he laid his head on the stone, and he went to sleep, and he had a dream where he saw angels going up and down a ladder. And when he woke up, um, he consecrated the stone he'd had his, his dream on, and he'd made a, a pact, a covenant with God. And the stone became the stone of destiny, or that's what we're taught to believe. But the, the whole idea is that this place, he calls it the Bethel. He's renaming the place where he, he had his dream Bethel, which means the house of God. And he sees this ladder as being um, the connecting link between earth and heaven. And again, it brings us back to this whole idea of these spheres of uh, rising and falling, of angels going up and down being able to ascend up and down through the heavenly spheres, like a ladder. And we'll be coming back to that idea in a later lecture, when we go into with, in more depth into the whole ideas behind um, the, the resurrection of man and the redemption after the fall. Now, Enoch, as we've uh, said earlier, um, is another name for Hermes. Uh, it's called Hermes by the Greeks, Thoth or Tehuti by the Egyptians. Enoch is the name he's known by by the Hebrews and has come down to us in the Bible. And the Bible tells us that uh, Enoch was the great-grandfather great of Noah. And it's got, it doesn't say very much about him, actually, which is surprising because he's actually a major character. But anyway, it says... And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, Enoch is the first person we meet with in the Bible who's said to have uh, gone body and soul straight into heaven. Um, second one is that we meet with, who this happens with, is Elijah, uh, who's swept off in a chariot um, into heaven. And the third person is Jesus, of course, who we're told went into a cloud, ascended into a cloud and disappeared in front of his apostles. Anyway, we, we encounter Enoch in other contexts, in the so-called Book of Enoch, which I'll come to in a second. But we meet, uh, in that book, it talks about the, the fallen angels, the Nephilim. Uh, we've already met them in the context of Adam and Eve and the temptation and the, the, the Satan coming down to earth and being cast out of heaven after a big battle of the angels. Um, but we have another story here, which seems to have taken place around the time of Enoch, which is seven generations after Adam. And it says here, And it came to pass, when men began, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto, unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years." There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare them children, the same became mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So we have here the story of the fallen angels, who, um, the, the Nephilim, who came down to earth and uh, fancied the, the local ladies and slept with them and begat children who became giants. 
the mighty men of old, it says in the Bible. Well, that story is much expanded in the book of Enoch. Enoch, the prophet, we're told here, is uh, summoned by God. And he, he actually has an out-of-body experience, um, which is, incidentally, that is how the Hermetica itself begins. It talks about an out-of-body experience that Hermes Trismegistus has when he's taken out of his body and he's shown the spheres of the heavens and everything that exists. And then he comes back to earth, back into his body, and he starts teaching his wisdom. Well, a similar thing happens to Enoch, and he's, he's taken to heaven, and he meets the archangels there. And he uh, is told by them and by God that he must go and give the bad news to the fallen angels, that they are, they've been judged and they're going to be punished for their sins because they filled the earth with blood. Their offspring, these giants, have been killing mankind and eating them. So they're, they're cannibalistic giants as well as everything else. And now they're all going to be judged and the, angel, the fallen angels are going to be cast out into the, the desert of Dudael where they're going to be bound. So we're having again this sense that there is something happened. Something happened and Enoch would have lived, assuming there really was a person uh, who was Thoth, Enoch, Hermes, he would have lived probably sometime around about the late 4th, early 5th cent uh, uh, millenniums BC, around the time actually of, of the start of dynastic Egypt. So we've, we're beginning to see here a connection between mythology, what's come down to us within these stories, within Book of Enoch, within the Bible, within other tales, and history. Something happened. Something happened to mankind around that time. We know something must have happened because when we look around us, there's this sudden change of life prior to that period People are starting to, to grow a few crops and they've got their flint spears and they're hunting game. But suddenly they're building temples, they're building pyramids, they're, they're building uh, cigarettes in Mesopotamia. A, a little bit later they're building Stonehenge in Britain um, with all its, its science that's included in that. And we're told within the Book of Enoch that it was these fallen angels who gave the, store, the, the, the secrets to mankind and taught them how to do these things. And incidentally, within Greek mythology, we have the same story again, um, that mankind was, uh, there was a particular titan, which is the Greek name for sort of ancient god, one of the ancient gods before the Olympians, a titan called Prometheus, who brought fire down from heaven and taught mankind sciences and how to do things. And for that, he was punished. He was punished by, by Zeus and put on a mountainside tied down where an eagle would come along and peck his liver every day. And then at night time, it would grow back and then it would be pecked again and grow back. Terrible punishment. So again, we've got this idea that this Titan, Prometheus, rather like the fallen angels, the Nephilim who came to earth, or like Lucifer who came, Lucifer the light bearer, Prometheus is a fire bearer. He brings fire from heaven down to earth. So we've got the same story looked at in a slightly different context, um, that the, those who brought civilization to mankind were premature maybe in what they did. They did something wrong, they're punished for it. But meantime, mankind learns things that he didn't know before. Learns how to use numbers, learns how to build pyramids, learns how to write books. And interestingly, within the Egyptian context, learning the writing and learning sciences and so on is also attributed to Thoth. So is Thoth, in a sense, one of these fallen angels? It gets weirder and weirder the deeper one goes into it. But we're beginning to see some kind of th something happened around about 4000 BC, 
which gave rise to these Bible stories, gave rise to the book of Enoch, but also resulted in this uh, fantastic acceleration in human evolution. And this, as you can see, this, is, this goes into many different areas and facets, but I think we should leave that for later lectures. For now, I want us to, to contemplate on the idea of the, this fall of man really being a spiritual fall, a loss of consciousness, of connection with the Godhead, coming down through the spheres, of these symbolic spheres of different levels of existence, down into the world of nature, being embraced by nature, taking on a form like an ape, um, an intelligent ape, but not really understanding who we really are. And from that perspective, we're tied by the wrist to nature, who is herself linked to God, but we're only experiencing God indirectly through her whilst we are alive in this world of nature. And what we do about that will be the subject of later lectures. Thank you very much.